it's interesting to hear you talk about the potential downside, particularly the non-MasterCard folks on there. I'm curious if you could tell us what's, what's the expectation on the upside? Like, if you get it right, what's the order of magnitude of improvement? You're going to dump the business? You're going to be able to, how much more can you get out of a customer if you really get big data right? So I'll, I'll take a swing at that. So it's substantial. And if you're looking for a percentage or a number, well, let's call it 142. <laughs> um, but 142. <laughs> they, all kidding aside, it's, there, there are a number of ways that, that if leveraged well, you, you could substantially change the, the way that you run your business. We think about our, our customers in, in two somewhat simple segments. Um, we think about them in, in a lot more detailed and granular ways, but a couple of the overarching ones are those that are stable and those who we refer to as persuadable. Uh, and the persuadable customers are generally those customers who are in flux in some fashion or another. Uh, leveraging our traditional um, data mechanisms, we tend to be able to identify when a customer is in flux about a cycle or two cycles in advance of that behavior becoming permanent. So that gives you basically one shot at, at persuading that customer one way or the other. Now, with advances in, in sort of the granularity of the data that we have and, the net, and leveraging the networks that we have, we think we can extend that cycle by you know, three or four more cycles. And so subsequently, you think about sort of the composition of, of your overall revenue, that could be, well, for us, it's a tremendous amount because there's a lot of volatility in, in our, in our uh, consumer behavior. Even a, a fraction change on that would have huge implications on the overall profit outlook for, for the company. So there's, if you do this and you can do this well, um, I suspect that you have examples at, at each one of these um, uh, locations and across industry as a whole. That's why I think there is a legitimate urgency around getting this right, because it, ultimately winners and losers may very well be judged on, on how they function in this space. Anybody else want to comment on that? Or? Yeah, I would just say like for, for a business like Quincy's where you have consumable-based businesses where it's pretty repeat-oriented, a fraction, uh, you know, a couple basis points change in, uh, in our repeat rate uh, can really move the needle in the lifetime value. So it's why we are trying to figure this out. If we can get a few learnings that can just slightly move the needle on that repeat rate, the LTV becomes that much more, how much we can spend on a customer becomes that much more, and how efficiently we convert the customer becomes that much better. So it's... I mean, there's huge upside ac across all elements of the business. I think in everywhere, that, in every spot that we've tested, especially online, you see a huge improvement in conversion um, and in demand. What's really interesting, I think, I personally think for Nordstrom is that you think about our salespeople. And we have our salespeople out in, we have 1,500 or 15,000 salespeople moving, you know, the middle of the pack just a little bit has huge implications. So I think it's, um, just not in, it's in the incremental on the online piece, but then you think about implementing and giving those salespeople who are working with a customer just a little bit more information to help them help that customer find the right thing. That's a pretty big upside there in just a small adjustment. I believe the learning rate, and you said you are still learning, uh, you know, how to do that in this, you know, in this sphere. So, but there are companies out there that do all these analytics, and they have been doing that for a long time, and you know, arguably they are specialists in, in doing these analytics. Do you take their help in figuring things out, how to analyze the data and how to move the needle? Or do you try to develop this ability in-house? Because I suspect there's a lot of repetition across companies doing the same thing. I mean. I'll, I'll, I'll take a crack at answering that first because I will probably have a different answer. Um, in our experience, uh, it's actually really hard to gather the data cleanse it so it's actually useful because it's awfully easy to get garbage data uh, and then store it in the right way and access it. Um, there's a lot of people that can analyze it, including some of ours. Uh, and we look at other people's tools all the time. But I actually think it's actually really hard um, to, the models are straightforward, but understanding the business implications and what it actually means is really hard. Uh, and that's, that's probably the hardest thing that we're finding right now is, uh, yes, there's lots of statistical models you could apply. There's lots of ways you could call the data. Um, what does it mean? And how are we going to turn it into something that actually moves the needle? 
uh, as I said before, in risk and, and fraud, you know, we've been doing it for 20 years and we're just starting to get good at it. Um, and, but to me, that's the, the insight. And if you don't have people that really understand the business, then uh, quant jocks by themselves, which is more often what you find or that we see outside, uh, aren't that useful. So I, it, to us, it's that intersection point between the business and data that's so hard. That's very well said. We've got We've got an organization of, of just under 200 analytics professionals. Uh, and within that, we've got uh, these series of uh, almost you know, behavioral tenets that we, that we are explicit about for, for the enterprise. And one of the first is that this is not an academic exercise um, because there's nothing more than, that an analyst loves than a really fancy model, whether or not it matters to anybody on the front lines. Um, and so that's, I think, a very, very important distinction around how these organizations tend to evolve. And within our own organization, we have a data logistics group that is designed to, to help us get the cleanest data possible in the most efficient way. And their skill set is dramatically different than um, parts, pockets of the rest of the organization. Within that, we also have data scientists and advanced analytics professionals who um, feel quite comfortable you know, putting together virtually any type of high-level statistical model. And then we also have this broader range of business experts that help inform uh, the work that happens across the entire um, enterprise. And for us, that works pretty well. And, and we're still leveraging that platform to create partnerships with other specialized groups outside of our industry. Um, because I do think that the, the space is evolving so fast, having a purely inward view of, of how to best manage this is probably going to result in, in some inefficiency. Um, but it, it is changing quite a bit, and I think there's a tremendous amount of opportunity out there for, for those who are looking for, for opportunities in this space. Um, <clears throat> when I think of so your question, people who do it better, um, absolutely get the point that there are companies out there who have been doing big data for a long time in some spaces. Example, Google right? or Facebook. Um, Facebook might do that for its marketing pro products. Um, Google might do it for its suite of products. But these companies may not offer it as a rent as a service for e-commerce. That's one class of companies which don't offer uh, big data as a service. The second class of companies that are being big data do it in among a vendor space, for example, product recommendation engines, promotion recommendation engines. They're all beginning to migrate to big data platforms so that they can actually do recommendations really well. And is it an option to uh, buy the talent in those each sectors? Yes. Um, but if you think of this, if this ends up being a competitive advantage, right? then it makes sense for companies to have this technology in the house, to have insights around it, so the business people can who own it. Um, if you rather outsource that out, right, uh, pretty sure over time, um, that technology is going to be available as a, as a uh, <coughs> widespread feature to everyone. Think of open source or think of anything like Hadoop is an open source platform. It's op available to everyone. So um, there is a long-term strategic advantage to people to actually build this. Um, the big thing is, again, this is aspirational. Can you do it? Can everyone do it? Everyone's trying. Uh, but I think the early leaders who build it would have competitive advantages there. Um, what is the process and, and how receptive is management or marketing to executing on the opportunities that you may mm -hmm. see in your roles? We have uh, something that we want to test or move forward with, provided it's not something that create, uh, takes uh, our development team tons and tons of resources, I would say, pretty much immediately. Um, you know, in retail, I think it's key. You have to be able to move forward and uh, move quickly. So, yeah, for us, it's pretty much right away. So that's actually a really good question because um, one of the challenges in this space is, is how, do you, how does it get integrated into operations on a going forward basis? And I think you know, in online space, so much of how you compete is on the basis of, of your learning agenda. So that's one space uh, in, in, in industry, but in, in more traditional um, bricks and mortar uh, type environments, it's not, you shouldn't take for granted that, there, that the analytics is going to have an equal seat at the table. 
um, versus all the other elements of, of the business. And in the same ways that you know, ideas get politicized, there's all kinds of agendas that, um, that, that could come in, in conflict with what the data suggests. And that's one of the things that, um, that I, I enjoy about my current employer is that they are very, they, they view themselves as competing on this, on this premise um, and have viewed themselves that, in that way for, for quite some time. But I worked at a number of other organizations prior and can tell you that the decision making process, regardless of how compelling an analysis may, may be, uh, isn't a given. And as we think about sort of winners or losers in the future, the ability to integrate analytics in a meaningful way into the operations, I think, will be a telltale distinction amongst companies. I think that building on that, it's pretty interesting, though, for the organization that I'm in and coming in with an MBA background and kind of heavy focus on data. Um, Nordstrom and fashion retail is heavily art side as well. So um, how do you balance the data and the information that you're getting with this gut merchant instinct? And um, I think we're seeing more of that online, which is you know interesting you have merchants here um, with that background and being able to use the data to inform and build supplement or kind of emphasize what we're, what people are intuitively knowing. But it's an interesting, I mean I think as Nordstrom, you know, the teams that are working on this and getting the good information and coming up and finding those insights, it's the balance and having that, I think everyone in retail now is more and more open to data needs to be a big part of that decision just versus just that art side or that gut merchant instinct and so bridging those two together. It's an evolution for sure, um, but I think online is the part where you see it really come to play and because you can make instant change and you can see how the customer behaves pretty quickly, whereas the brick and mortar side, it's, it's harder to capture the net results of things. One thing about, uh, um, so A-B testing, absolutely yes, everyone said it's really easy to test quick, but as a business owner, it's always important to recognize that big data doesn't give black and white answers. It's, it doesn't tell you with absolute confidence. If you're in Hanover, you could say it's gonna be cold today, but uh, it's like other places, so it might be cold, maybe cold, may not be cold. There's a confidence interval. Uh, a lot of divisions don't speak statistics. They don't understand concepts like that. Um, and as a business owner, you also have to be cognizant of the fact that the results might change over time. So just because you got a result today, doesn't mean that result is gonna hold in two weeks or in three weeks. So you have to keep adapting. This, this testing process is not, you got a result implement, go, uh, you have to challenge those assumptions constantly, which is a cost. Um, have you noticed any changes in customer and consumer behavior as you make recommendations? Have people already become inured to some of the tricks? Are there companies that are being left behind that are not adapting fast enough? Or have you not uh, noticed any insight from that yet? Is it truly, are everyone's on the, cut, on the kind of the early stage of this, um, or are people already separating from their ability to access customers and continue to engage differently? I don't like to call them tricks. <laughs> Great, um, no. But I think um, while we're saying there are people who are on the forefront. I mean, Google is out there, really good at this. There are companies that are that consumers day to day are interacting with, and so I think the expectation changes once you have constant interaction. So the 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 analogy that comes to mind for me most is you're in Google, you're searching for something, and it is a restaurant and you have no idea how Google just filled in your predictive search, right? So that is amazing and exciting the first time it happens and you come to believe it and expect that over and over. Now you come to Nordstrom.com and you start typing in our search bar, your expectation has changed. So I think um, even though we're all kind of at the beginning, there are, there are external factors and things that we're interacting with daily that we need to be watching and saying, okay, well, what is the next bar? I mean, at some point, like one question was, what's the incremental value and then at, pretty quickly it becomes table, table stakes to just having that good customer experience. And so I think we constantly have to be watching all models um, and all different interactions, whether it's in payment services, it's the online space, um, the hospitality industry. The, your expectation changes pretty quickly as a consumer. Part of it goes back, I think, to something we talked about before as well. The insights are one thing. What you do with them is something completely different. Well, not completely different, hopefully. but And, and you could have... I don't know if there's tricks around generating the insights, but then what value prop you create from that or what experience you create from that or uh, what you do with it 
uh, can change dramatically. I think that's where the real business expertise comes in. So yeah, they, they get tired of, uh, you know, they see them as tricks or that you're trying to change their behavior or give them something that they don't really want and you should be smarter. But I think that's, that's sort of up to us to make sure that we take those insights and do something with them rather than the insights themselves. So there's all kinds of potential hazards, if not contemplated well in, in executing against some of these findings. So I'll give you a sort of a benign one. Um, I may have a view about customer price elasticity throughout the, the course of a booking window for a hotel room. And on day zero before arrival, the value of that hotel room is nothing to me if I don't fill it. Uh, now, if I have a view that customers are tremendously price sensitive in the last week before arrival, and a small change in, in dip in price will result in, in, in a huge uptick in, in conversion, then that might be meaningful for me. Now, if the entire customer base recognizes that that's how a, a, a company views its yielding opportunity, it's in their interest to wait till that last minute because prices are going to dump, and then you end up creating more uncertainty around you know, sort of what, your, what the value of your, your inventory is, and you start to get operators that get nervous, you panic, and it's basically a self-fulfilling prophecy. And so when we see some of these things, we're, all, we're constantly debating what's the implication of operating against that finding, and is that something that aligns with sort of the long-term value that we're trying to create um, with the company and how we want to operate, or does this actually create some risk if we train our customers to act in, in a given way? So I think uh, if you separate the big data learning from the outcome, the outcome you hopefully are coming up with a good outcome. People are going to take that as a minimum barrier and say, I'm getting used to this. So it just moves up the quality thresholds tremendously. Uh, have I seen any revolutionary uh, pushes in this space? Probably not yet. I think everyone's trying to figure this out and get that threshold up. Once they get that up, the rest of them will start looking a little pale in comparison. I'm really curious as to what all of you uh, are seeing and are doing in the areas that perhaps aren't so traditional in, in, uh, in big data. For instance, the variety of data, both the types of data and the sources of data are something that has increased rapidly. Um, unstructured data, being married with structured data. So how, how are you guys going about that and what things, what streams are you combining there? <laughs> so uh, I, can, I can talk for us. One of, one of the things that, and, and I repeat, we are very early in the process. We're trying to understand how our uh, massive amounts of purchase data can be combined, but we found that it's not nearly as valuable by itself as when we combine it with other data. So some of it's structured. Um, uh, risk bureaus, for instance, you know, try and track different risk behaviors that we can combine with our purchase data. Um, we actually do primary market research, uh, but again, we're testing and learning still. So I, I'm not sure there's a simple answer into the, the kinds of things we're doing, other than we're struggling with um, what data will add value when combined with our data, and, and how do we build the partnerships and the, and the feeds so that we can combine that data again. Uh, and we're, we're still figuring out how to do that. Um, so it's critically important. We learned early on that even the huge amount of data we have by ourselves, it can be a lot more valuable when we marry it up with other stuff. But we're still striking deals, figuring out how, it, how we can hook it up, and, and that's you know, bringing data into our data set, but also in the way we provide it to our customers as well, whether they be banks or merchants or, or mobile operators or others. As yes, everybody loves the story when again, they got on Twitter and talked about this terrible service experience, and then before they, they walked out on the check, somebody had, had, had responded to, to what you wrote on, on uh, social media. And so that, those are things that, that are real initiatives for, I think, a lot of organizations. And I'm glad to continue to hear that you know, it's early days because you know, for our organization this is true too. But those are, there's a number of advances that make this real now. And so for us, we've got, we can draw a pretty direct line between a customer service score and how he or she will transact with us on a given trip as well as over a lifetime. Now when we marry that with the way they're, the indicators that they're providing us on social media in real time, that gives us an opportunity to, to interject 
within TRIP and outside of TRIP to, to preserve or recover from any, um, uh, any problems that they may be having. Um, but also there's, there's other elements. So for us, there's, you know, there's no structured way for us to capture how long somebody has to sit in the line. Or if they walked by a blackjack table, didn't stop to play because there wasn't a dealer there. Um, but there are technologies now that, that start to enable that. And for us, you know, the more properties you visit on, you know, within our footprint, that's meaningful. And you know, a phone can help us identify some of that. Uh, so there's plenty of opportunity, and, and I think we've got a pretty clear roadmap as to how we're going to get after it. But it's still is early days. Um, I think the first step along the way, at least, uh, we think about is uh, for an e-commerce company, one of the most critical things is how fast does the page load, right? How, if, if it's a slow site, you're just not going to interact with it. And there are tremendous things you do in the back end to preserve that speed of the site so the consumer has a very positive experiences. That kind of goes counter to a lot of traditional data analysis methods, which would be slower. Uh, so one of the first promises I think we can get out of this is more real-time decision-making that can integrate with an e-commerce site and still have that same quick experience. I'm curious, uh, what are the biggest, in the past three years maybe, what are the technologies that have had the most significant impact on the way that you can u collect big data or use big data or enable your business with big data? I mean, what have been the, big, the biggest kind of leaps that have really enabled you in the way that you're able to be a big data business and effectively use it? I think you know, cloud-based computing becoming not only more available but just cheaper. Uh, I think provide is going is providing already a huge opportunity for anyone who wishes to take advantage of it. So I'd say that's definitely one of the biggest things. And storage cost that would be a huge thing too. Storage cost is just coming down, which is allowing you to to backfile things which are not in real time, so you can still bring it back later for analysis. But a lot of the computing costs are just going down. I think for us, it's um, uh, Ruben mentioned it already. Is mobile, uh, and it's it's a location awareness potential. So it's where, where I mean, big data is at the front end. Using mobile is at the very front end, um, and so we think about how it's connected to payments, and and therefore how it's connected to offering deals. But the you know technologies is this where you know they know the SKU you're standing in front of. Um, and that, uh, or the story you're walking by, or, or what's going on. And to me, that's going to provide a huge amount of more data uh, that we can marry in. Now, we don't, we don't have anything to do with that yet, MasterCard, but that's where, where the, our customers that we talk to uh, see those as really powerful ways to get very specific uh, value propositions in front of consumers uh, based on where they are and what they're doing. Uh, so I think that's going to add a huge amount of more uh, potential richness uh, to, to what goes on, and we're just starting to see it. I think mobile, by far, is the, the data source that has the most potential for changing the way we think about consumer, or measure, or look at consumer behavior. We're not there, um, and there's obviously privacy constraints. That's a big privacy bucket to be figured out, but to think about now, every consumer is interacting with a, com with a device that is giving off data, sending and receiving data at all times. Um, both with you in your store, outside of your store, interacting on different websites. I think there's huge, huge potential there to create some really amazing, use that information, but then also serve up the data. So again, you know, back to bridging the online, the online piece into in-store, well, you now have a platform for doing that. Figuring that out, though, I think we've, there's not a ton of people that are on really on the forefront there. I think there's interesting um, applications that are coming out that are starting to bridge that gap, but bringing that all together, I think goes back to our original questions of how are you using it, how are you getting the clean data, and then the privacy piece really comes into play with mobile. But I think there is the biggest potential for change and disruption. How involved are your companies or concerned are your companies about current legislation and legislation that could be coming through Congress on clamping down on the amount of data you're able to collect and the ways that you're able to use it? I can start back. Um, data is, a, is like a very, very um, touchy issue in the company in the sense we're very strong about making sure data is secure. There are two parts to the question, which one is uh, having data and using it. Second is sharing data. We don't share data. That is a 
even more trickier part of the puzzle, which a lot of the questions you have, people get a lot more upset when they understand data share. Um, in terms of uh, legislation um, that we follow about data, it has to be compliance, whether you have, you have PCA compliance, Sarbanes-Oxley, whatever, that, you have to have compliance. And I can tell you, um, you cannot be in the e-commerce space without having a very high level of trust with your consumer. Because once you drop the ball, you're pretty toast. So um, you have to make sure you're covered, complete in compliance. Uh, in terms of a synthetic experience, that can happen even more, I think, if you share with partner sites and you happen to figure out that I did this on this side, therefore I saw this on this side. Uh, on, on a single side itself, we still feature products and uh, things like that. It's no, no different from the older products. They're just more products you'd like. So it's, the disconnect is not very strong. If I'm seeing something totally new out of the world just because you track me, I would be very upset about that. You know, what do you see, you know, the seventh, eighth, ninth innings once sort of all the companies have started using this data? Um, I mean, it, it seems to me that you're going to reach a point of diminishing returns mm -hmm. and sort of how, how you see that evolving. Is this just going to ha have to be sort of a necessary uh, function um, that every company is going to need? Um, so if you could speak to that, thanks. Do you happen to be a baseball fan? No. <laughs> well, then this will go over like a lead balloon. Um, so I am a baseball fan. And how many of you guys have read Moneyball? Uh, so I happen to have an audience with, with Paul D. Podesta, who is the um, Jonah Hill character in, in the film. And I asked him, why would you possibly agree to, to having this book published, uh, given the resources that you guys were, were working with? And his point was, everybody's going to do it anyway. We might as well become famous for it. <laughs> um, but, but I guess you know, in, in some ways, it's a bit instructive, right? Because he is accurate. And for those of you who haven't read it, you know, there, there was a, a small market organization competing primarily on their view of, of leveraging analytics to, to operate within their business. And in fact, uh, um, take on some sacred cows within conventional wisdom in the industry. And, and they proved to be quite successful in doing so. And so now every organization has their, their statisticians and their sabermetricians within, the, the, um, within their front offices. So you get back to you know, sort of the, the integration of that within operations, the intuition that, that drives performance. And you know, frankly, data can only take you so far. You, you still have to have you know, a view on, on your customer and the product that you're providing that it gets informed by a wide range of things, data being just a component of that. You're, that that's really well said. I mean, if you think about the execution side of it, so if you're, what's the marketing message? So you may say, okay, here's all these segments I want to hit and deliver all these messages, but it's delivering the right message um, and delivering the right creative to that person or the right offer. Um, there's still an execution arm to it. Um, and. I think this, we can all agree the seventh, eighth, ninth innings are a long ways away from uh, where we are right now. But at some point, it's like anything that, that's in any business's tool set um, and is being able to execute better than the next guy. There's no in, there's probably no eighth inning, right? So we're all here, we're all in consumer driven businesses, and the consumer's expectations and needs are constantly evolving. So I think that's the piece of it. It's, it will either become faster at responding, faster at identifying, hopefully, what their needs are and what their wants are, better at responding to them. But both of those are how you do that. There's opportunities for competitive advantage there. Uh, but as soon as you get to that end game, then it's what's the next evolution. I think for you know Nordstrom, what our team, our, um, those with people with last name Nordstrom who run our company talk about service being the best in service is our number one goal. We will never be there. We will never be able to reach that goal because it's constantly evolving. So it's always an aspiration that we need to get to. And I think it's the same thing. This, how we use information and even the sources of information that we have today. I mean, we talk about mobile. That's, it's been around for a while, but it hasn't been around for a long time. And social media, right? There's another whole piece of information that's coming in, what we're going to have as information sources in five years and what people's privacy concerns are in five years are going to be completely different. We're going to have to evolve. And I think that's part of, as we make investments in the systems and in the resources and figuring this out, it's how do you invest in knowing that you're going to need flexibility and that you're, 
invest in this uncertainty that's in the future. And that's a hard, it's a shift in mindset and it's a shift in a way of thinking about things um, that I think will continually evolve and no one's gonna have it figured out per se. I mean, we are all excited that none of us had it figured out as we came into this panel, but I think, I mean, five years from now, we will be better and we'll be using it in new ways, but there's gonna be some other big question that we're gonna be trying to tackle. But, but I think the, you know, the incremental return for getting that much better will start to decline, but it is a long way from declining. Uh, I go back to the, you know, the MasterCard's experience, which is, again, big data around fraud and, and uh, risk. Um, the, the initial improvements were staggering, and now you're, they're arguing over basis points, so you know, hundreds of a, hundreds of a percent. Um, and that's, it's the price of doing business. You don't do it, you're in trouble. So the downside risk is enormous, um, but again, the incremental improvement starts to get compressed, but we're a long way, I think, from that yet. And it's unclear when, when that'll start to happen.